Well, good evening. If you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount about prayer. Now, the call to worship that we read was a similar passage. Uh, it contains the Sermon, or not the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's actually referred to as the Sermon on the Plain, but it contains what we know as the Lord's Prayer as well. And maybe you recognize that uh, in Luke chapter 11. But it's interesting that there's a lot of differences in the context of Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew chapter 6. So if you recall from the, uh, the call to worship passage, Jesus was praying and his disciples asked him, if he would teach them how to pray. And so he goes into the Lord's Prayer, and then he goes into talking about, you know, if you go to a friend and ask for something, and it goes into all of that. But when we come, when we come over here to the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is teaching here in, in Matthew chapter 6, the context is very different. And the context is really fascinating. And so I, we are going to spend some time looking at the actual Lord's Prayer tonight, but before we get into that, I want us to look a little bit at the context to see why it's so different and, and what Jesus is trying to get across to us. Now, all of us probably have a moment in our life where we remember that we received some advice that was really good advice. Maybe you were a young kid trying to decide what you were going to do with your life, whether it's where to go to college or a spouse to marry or, or lots of different things. But we all probably can think back to a time when we asked somebody that we trusted, whether it was a parent or a pastor or someone with influence in our life, and they gave us some really awesome advice, advice that we'll never forget. But sometimes when we're in that situation, we, we ask for advice, and, and the best thing that we're told is what not to do. Sometimes when you're told what not to do, that's, that's maybe even better than being told what to do. I remember when I joined the Navy, it was right out of high school. And in that, you know, waiting to go, like you've graduated high school, but you're waiting to join the military, you're about to go to boot camp, there's a whole lot of unknowns. You don't really know exactly what it's going to be like. You don't really know how much they're going to yell at you. You don't really know how little sleep you're going to get. And so there's a lot of anxiety in that moment. But I had a great recruiter, and this recruiter, he didn't lie to me. He didn't try to, you know, make things sound better than they were going to be. He would stay in constant contact with all of the previous guys that he had put in the Navy, and so they were telling him exactly what it was like. And so I'm hearing not from somebody who went to boot camp 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I'm hearing from guys that just graduated like two months ago, three months ago, four months ago. So this is recent knowledge. And one of the things that I remember hearing him say was you don't want to make a scene and stick out. You just want to blend in and just be not noticed. That is the best thing you can do to get through boot camp as easy as possible. And it wasn't something he told me to do. It was something he told me not to do. And so just uh, this last summer, uh, our neighbor right across the street, their son joined the army. And uh, he was getting ready to go off to boot camp. And so I was asking my neighbor, I said, so is he ready to go? And he said, yeah, I think so. He told me that when he gets there, he's going to try and crack a joke with the staff sergeant and, you know, uh, try and, you know, get in good with him. So, you know, it'll be a great time. And I said, yeah, that's, that's really terrible. He, he should not do that. And I told him exactly the advice that was told to me before I went to boot camp, some, you know, 12, 15, I don't, even, I don't know how long ago that was. Uh, it was a while ago. And I said, man, if, if he wants to have a great experience in boot camp, then he should just lay low, do what he's told, and not make a scene. Don't try to make that joke because that's going to make you stick out, and then they're going to make it harder for you. They're gonna, it's going to make your time there worse. And he has not been back yet, so I don't know if he took my advice or not. But uh, I asked my neighbor just the other day to remind him that Navy just beat Army in the Army-Navy game. Uh, and he said he would when he gets his phone back. So he doesn't have his phone right now, so maybe that's an indication of how that, how that went for him. Uh, but anyway, let's focus back here on the Sermon on the Mount. The beginning of chapter 6, Jesus introduces this idea that he's going to uh, continue teaching on throughout the rest of the chapter. I want you to look at chapter 6, verse 1. 
He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So the first thing Jesus is warning us of here in chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount is to be aware of practicing our righteousness before other people. Now, this is a Sunday evening crowd. All of us are, are pretty well uh, involved in church. We're here a lot. We do a lot of activities. We're, we've been in church for quite some time. We're familiar with how Christians live and operate and the way we talk and the types of things that we say. And it's really easy for us to fall into patterns of doing certain things that seem religious or that seem like we're really walking with the Lord or we're really doing things, but we're only doing them because we've always done them. We don't necessarily have the heart behind it that is seeking a, a desire to honor the Lord in what we're doing. We can fall into patterns of just doing things we've always done because we've always done them. And this is not true just of church. This is true of lots of different things. It's true of just the way that we live. The older I get, my wife reminds me, the more I'm like my dad. And I don't notice these things, but she has observed my dad from a distance, and she lives with me, obviously. And so anytime I do something that is similar to my dad, she's like, all right, Mark. And I'm like, stop, stop, right? Those, those progressive commercials are onto something. We become like our parents. And Jesus is warning us that we can be that way with the way that we are religious as well. If we're not careful, we can start practicing our righteousness before other people, not because our heart is, is devoted and, and desiring to honor him, but just because that's the way we're doing things. Or as he says here, practicing our righteousness before other people to be seen by them. Now there's a whole other category of, right, sometimes we just get into doing things because we've always done them, but sometimes we do them intentionally so that other people see what we're doing. And that is specifically what Jesus is getting at here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so the first topic that he addresses is giving to the needy. And so he says in verse 2, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. Okay, so there's this expectation that followers of Jesus will be generous people. We will give to those in need. But he says, when you do it, don't do it in such a way that you're being noticed by people. Because if that's your motivation, if all you desire and care about is that other people see you be generous to other people, that is your reward. There will be no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So then we get to the Lord's Prayer. And look, we'll pick up in verse 5. He says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. We'll get into the rest of it here in just a minute. But the first thing that we need to address and the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is, what is our motivation for praying? Why do we pray to the Lord? Now, a great question to ask ourselves is, when do we pray? And if the answer is only ever when I'm in public and around other believers, well, that's problematic. Because the first thing that Jesus says here is that when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Okay, so he just says in general that there are hypocritical people and you don't want to be like them. Now, we all know who he's referring to. He's talking about the Pharisees. They were very, very outwardly religious, but inside they did not honor God. They were strict about adhering to all the aspects of the law, but yet their hearts were far from the Lord. And we, as, as believers who have been in church for a long time, we can sometimes fall into that. If we are not careful, if we are not constantly checking our heart and the motivation of our heart, we can become that without even realizing that we've become that. 
I don't think the Pharisees would have gone around saying, hey, we know that our hearts are far from God, but man, look how awesome we are at obeying. I think they genuinely thought that they were honoring the Lord. But they didn't stop to reflect on where their heart was, what the motivation was for why they were obeying the law. What was their motivation for why they did all the religious things that they did? And so Jesus says that they are hypocritical. And then he says, he explains why they're hypocritical. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. So this is the second time that Jesus has used this phrase to be seen by others. He said that with giving to the needy. He says it now about the Lord's Prayer. And if you look forward to uh, verse 16, he says it about fasting. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. There is a real threat to us as believers that we practice our religion in order to be seen by others. Jesus knows this is a reality. Jesus knows this is very dangerous. And so Jesus is warning everybody who's listening to him preach this sermon that that is not a proper motivation for praying. Now, if you look at the culture that we live in, the reality is it is very much so driven by social media. Now, I know some of us are older in here, and maybe we're not as into social media as some of the younger people is, but there are some older people that I have seen that are very much so involved, or you know, we could even say a little too involved with social media. That happens. And the idea behind it is the whole reason we post things is to be seen by others. Is that not right? That's the whole reason that we put anything out there on social media, whether it's a, a big event that we went to or whether it's a cool thing that we got to do for somebody. We post a picture of ourselves there being a part of it because we want to be recognized. We want to be seen as taking part in these fun things or these big activities. And the idea is that the more people notice that and like it and comment on it, the more the better it makes us feel. And so we continue to do it. And it's this addictive behavior. And tons and tons of studies have been done saying that there are direct links between depression and social media usage. Because we can get into that cycle of being seen by others, and that is what is motivating us to do it more and more and more. And so what's amazing to me is that we're reading the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached way back when he lived in like 2,000 years ago, and it is so relevant for you and for me in 2021. We are so tempted by our culture to live in such a way that we are seen by other people. Now, we as individuals do this, we, we are guilty of this, but also churches do this as well. There are times where churches can be, and I don't think they're doing this intentionally to be, um, you know, look at us, but churches love to point out all the wonderful things that they're doing. And they love to tell everybody else about it. Hey, look at all the things that we've done. Look at what, he, what we've accomplished, right? And we're not saying that you can't say that ever, Right? We should celebrate when we baptize people, but we're, we're never really worried about counting numbers and making sure that we're doing more than the next church or anything like that because it's a matter of the heart. Right? We don't ever want to get into a, a competition where we are only doing things or saying all of these things because we want to be noticed or seen by others. It's a great danger. And if we get caught in that trap, Jesus is telling us, that that in and of itself is our reward. So he says, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Now let's just be honest. Jesus is teaching that there is a reward for Christian living. There is a reward for following Christ. Doing things without, without a proper motivation, the reward is being seen by other people, being noticed, feeling that recognition. But there is also another reward. Look at what he says. 
Truly, I say they have received their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. God is saying that there is a wrong motivation to why we pray and why we give to the needy and why we fast and why we do all these other things, but there is also a right motivation. And no matter which motivation you you choose or you're following after, there is a reward for each of those. One of those rewards is very short and temporary and does not last and keeps you wanting more and more and more. And one of those rewards is eternal and is unfading and is kept in heaven for you. Jesus talks about that a little bit later here in chapter 6. Right? Do not store up treasure here on earth, but rather in heaven. Okay? There is a reward for those of us who are living the Christian life as we are seeking to honor God in all that we do. Jesus is telling us and teaching us that there is a reward that is coming. But it is not a reward in this lifetime. We should not be so focused on being rewarded now and here in the immediate but rather trust that God will give it to us in his timing, in eternity. So he says that we should not do what we do, and talking specifically here about praying, in order to be seen by other people, but rather, he says, we should go into our room, we should shut the door and pray to our Father who is in secret. Jesus is not teaching that we should not pray in public. He's not teaching that we shouldn't pray in in worship services or in groups of people. But he is saying that that should not be the only time that we pray. When we gather on a Wednesday night and we pray in in a group setting downstairs, or even tonight, when we raise raise our hands and lift our prayer requests, and when we pray together as as a church, Jesus is not saying that those things are wrong. But what he's warning us is that if that's the only time that we pray, something might be wrong. Something might be wrong there. Because the habit of a Christian should not be only praying in public so that other people hear us, but rather the the habit of Christians should be, as Jesus describes here in verse 6, going into our room, shutting the door, and praying to our Father who is in secret. You see, when we do that, Nobody else even knows that that happened. Sometimes when we do things and nobody's around to see it, we're like, oh, man, nobody even saw me do that awesome thing. Right? And it's almost like disappointing. Like, oh, well, I'll, ne- I'll never receive any recognition for that. But look at what he says. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. We also need to be reminded tonight that God the Father sees everything. He sees in secret. All those things that you did and maybe you thought somebody was watching, you thought you'd get a little recognition and nobody noticed, God noticed. All those prayers that you prayed all by yourself, maybe nobody else heard, God heard. All those thoughts that you thought deep in your heart, deep in your mind, that nobody else knows you've ever thought, God knows. And God rewards those who seek him in secret. Verse 7, he also says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. So now this is the second time, specifically related to prayer, that Jesus is saying what not to do. It says, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. I think oftentimes we get into a, um, we get into the thought of thinking or the line of thought that the more or the longer that our prayer is, the more spiritual it is, or the, or the more powerful it is, or the more big words we use when we pray, the more effective our prayer is going to be. But there's not a single verse in the Bible that supports that idea. I think that's just come from, from religious people hearing other people pray for a long amount of time, and we just think, man, that sounds really good. 
or we hear somebody pray and use big words and, and all of that, and we think, man, that person is, mm, man, they are a prayer. We were even at camp one year. I don't, I don't even remember what year this was, but one of the camp pastors, every time he prayed, he was quoting scripture, a lot of scripture as he prayed. And I remember thinking at the time, like, man, that's awesome. I love that. But I don't know anything else about his prayer life. So if that's the only time that he's praying and he's quoting all this scripture, maybe to flex on us that he knows all this scripture, he's got it uh, memorized in his heart, then that's terrible. Now, hopefully, hopefully he's got all that scripture memorized in his heart because of Psalm 119.11. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And it just naturally comes out as he prays. But Jesus is saying, if the only time that we pray is in front of other people to be heard by them, that's not good. And now he says, don't fall into the trap of thinking you need, to, you need to heap up empty phrases. Maybe you've heard people pray certain things or you've heard certain phrases that people use in your prayers all the time. So you start using them because it sounds better and it sounds more religious or it sounds more like, you know, we're a better prayer or we're a better Christian if we say those things. And Jesus says, don't do that. You don't have to pray specific words, specific phrases for a certain amount of time in order to be heard by God. As a matter of fact, he says, do not be like them. And here's why. For your father knows what you need before you even ask him. God already knows everything that you're about to pray for before you even pray. That's kind of comforting because there's a lot of times when I pray and Samantha can attest to this, that she will ask me to pray for something right before I pray, and I forget to pray for it. And then I say amen, and she looks at me, and I'm, oh, and also, it happens. We are forgetful people, right? There are things that are on our heart that we know, that we are thinking about, and God is aware of that. We need to be reminded that God sees in secret. Nothing in our heart, nothing in our mind is ever hidden from God or hidden from his sight. He sees it all and he knows it all. So when we pray, Jesus is saying, don't think you have to be all, all like extra spiritual and use these big words or phrases. Just come to him and just speak to him. Just make your requests known to him because he already knows what you need. And yet, even though he already knows what we need, he desires that we would come and pray to him. Isn't that amazing? God already knows everything we're about to say. He already knows everything that we need. He even knows everything that we're about to forget to say that we know that we need. But he still wants us to pray to him. He still desires that we would come to him in prayer. And then he says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. First thing he wants us to do is to honor him in prayer. Our Father, hallowed be your name. If you're not sure what hallowed means, it means to, to honor or to rev, uh, reverence his name. That we should remember who it is that we're praying to. We are praying to the creator of the universe. We are praying to God Almighty who spoke and everything came to be. We should pray that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done because oftentimes we get into the rut of thinking about ourselves and our own kingdom, don't we? We start thinking about all the ways that we can pray to make our life better and to make our situation improve. When in reality, we should be continually praying that God would advance his kingdom I remember hearing this, I've heard it multiple times, but if everything that we prayed for in the last week would be answered the way that we prayed for it, whose kingdom would advance, yours or God's? That's a good question to ask ourselves. Are we praying that God's, God's will would be done? Are we praying that that? God would continue to raise up people to go to the nations, or are we just praying that everyone around us, everyone that we know is healthy and happy and safe and secure? Great question to ask. He also says to give us this day our daily bread. Jesus, right after he was fasting for 40 days in the wilderness, Satan tempted him to turn a stone into bread, and Jesus' response 
was man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus understands that, that Christians need spiritual nourishment, spiritual food. And what that food is, is the word of God. And so he says that we should be regularly praying and asking that God would be feeding us, that he would be revealing to us truth from his word, and that would be strengthening us and building us up. He then, in verse 12, says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, he, explain, he expands on this even more right after the prayer, so let's look forward to, uh, to verse 13 right quick. He says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, as we walk through the Christian life, we are going to experience temptation. We are going to be tempted to sin, and we need to be regularly praying that God would deliver us from that. Then he says, so back up to verse 12, he says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, right? We need to be reminded that we are sinners. And as sinners, we need forgiveness. So part of what Jesus is saying here is that we need to be constantly people who are praying, asking God for forgiveness. Now, that should not be the only reason that we pray. Jesus was a man of prayer, and he never once had to confess a sin and ask for forgiveness. But he is saying that we need to be confessing our sins, and we need to be seeking God for forgiveness. We need to be reminded of our need for the gospel. We need to confess our sins to God and remind ourselves that we are not worthy to be called sons of the king, except for the fact that his son laid down his life to forgive us of our sins. You see, this is the aspect where we should be regularly reminding ourselves of the truth of the gospel. I know that what I did was wrong. I confess and I ask God to forgive me of that. And I remind myself that the blood of Jesus covers all of my sins. We need to remind ourselves of that every single day. Because every single day, I know all of us are aware of all the ways in which we fall short, in which we sin, in which we don't meet God's standard. And if all we think about is that over and over and over again, and we let those things compound on top of each other, we are going to be people who are beat down. But as we confess those sins, if we are reminding ourselves that Jesus shed his blood on the cross for my sins, man, that's going to make us new. That is going to revive us. That is going to bring health into our souls. But as we pray that, look at, look at what he says. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now he expands on this in verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus instructs us to pray in such a way that we ask God to forgive us of our sins in the same way that we forgive those who've sinned against us. Wow. God, forgive me the way I've forgiven others. Are you a person who's willing to forgive when you're wrong? Are you a person that holds grudges? Or do you understand what God has done for you and his son Jesus? And because of that forgiveness, you are able to then go and forgive whatever wrong is done against you. That is hard. But that is what Jesus has called his followers to. To be people who understand that, man, we have been forgiven of something that we cannot bear. We cannot bear the burden of sin on our own. And because God has, has sent his son to lift that burden and to, to bear that himself, then he says that we also then should be those who forgive others. You see, Jesus teaches us here in the Lord's Prayer how we should pray, the types of things that we should be praying for. But also he warns us of the dangers of being a hypocrite about it. And that's the, that's the context here in which he uses the, sermon, or the Lord's Prayer to teach his disciples how to pray. But he warns us, watch your motivation. Watch the reasons for why you do what you do. Be cautious about why you pray. Be cautious about how you go about it. Because the heart 
matters. Proverbs tells us to guard your heart, for from it flow the springs of life. Why we do the things that we do as believers is absolutely important, and Jesus stresses that here in the Sermon on the Mount when he teaches us to pray. Let's make sure our hearts are fixed on Jesus and wanting to honor him and obey him and exalt him. And let's let all of our religious activities and all the things that we do flow from that heart, not from a heart that desires to be seen and recognized by others. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness and that you are willing to separate our sins as far as the east is from the west. God, we need all of the promises of Scripture. We need to be fed daily from your word. And God, we need to be reminded that we need to check our hearts, that we need to be sure that we are motivated by honoring you and loving you and worshiping you and not being seen by others. God, we thank you for the Sermon on the Mount. We thank you for teaching us. It's amazing how relevant your words from 2,000 years ago are still today. God, we love you. We pray that you help us in these things. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You all are dismissed.